You're listening to this special episode of The Dental Guys, co-presented by the Academy of Osteointegration. This episode featuring Academy President Dr. Clark Stanford. Dr. Stanford joins us to discuss the current state of dental implant education, how the AO's certificate and fellowship programs are making a mark in this arena, and also weighs in on his views on what's most important for implant success. We know you won't wanna miss this special episode of The Dental Guys. Looking for a lab that understands the bridge between art and science? Check out the Dental Crafters Network. Dental Crafters, one relationship, infinite possibilities. Contact them at 1-800-472-8302 or at dentalcrafters.net. Do you want to learn to predictably place and restore dental implants using the most modern science and technology? We are talking 60 hours of CE in a comprehensive curriculum and live surgical implant placement on pre-selected patients. Head over to RestorativeDrivenImplants.com to learn more today. And welcome to this special episode of The Dental Guys. I'm Wes The Dental Guy. And I'm John The Dental Guy. And yes, Wes, this is a special episode. We have the president of the Academy of Osteointegration coming to us for an interview. And Wes, let's talk about Let's, for those of you who are just maybe listening to this for the first time and wondering who we are, maybe you're associated with the Academy, um, mm-hmm. and you're maybe wondering what AO even is, if this is maybe, you know, you haven't been listening to us for a while. Wes, let's go back. Right. Let's go back to where we first, you and I, because this is way before we knew each other, how we first got involved with the organization and why we have stuck with it. You know, Wes, kind of tell that story a little bit. You know, the interesting thing about the AO is it's been around as long as I've been a dentist, actually longer. And um, in dental school, it just so happened that John and I received the same award. We were in two different dental schools, and there was a student implant uh, dental award, and we received that. And you, you you received a free subscription to Jomi. Yeah, because it was the Aussie- Academy of Austin Integration Award. To yeah. like outstanding student in implant dentistry. And, and I don't know what I did. At the I time, I, did, I was John. interested in implants and I did some That's it. stuff and I did yeah. maybe a little extra and I, I maybe I asked the right questions. I think that's what it was. The and right they, questions. And they saw that maybe I was, could, you know, be interested in this. But at the time, I had no idea really what that meant or really a lot about the organization until mm. I went to the first annual meeting. Now, both Wes and I had read the journal for years. And it Mm -hmm. was two years after I got out of school, two years after I went to my first annual meeting and uh, it blew my mind. It blew Mm -hmm. my mind. I mean, here we had, you know, there were things there that I had never seen, Mm -hmm. which is what I, what you want. And there were people there from the clinical side and the research side and the educational side. At that time, even more specialist driven, although it was starting to change and still is, mm-hmm. you know, has a ton of specialist involvement and a lot of educational involvement from residencies, residencies and things. But as you're going to hear Dr. Stanford talk about, there's been a real push by this organization to get uh, general dentists as well involved in the organization, which I think they've been very successful with, uh, with mm-hmm. doing to have a real, you know, team based approach, synergistic approach, multidisciplinary approach. And Wes, you know, we have, we have kind of had this little bit of an orbit even around Dr. Stanford because going back to when you and I met in Sweden at an implant meeting, which is so random, uh, he was there giving one of the big presentations. I mean, he's been mm-hmm. around implant dentistry with a company that both you and I had worked with years ago, mm-hmm. uh, you know, very heavily involved in research uh, mm-hmm. and, and also now is the dean of U- at UIC. I mean, he, he's really kind of been one of our dental heroes. Yeah, dental heroes. We 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 really like having someone of this caliber on the show, mm-hmm. um, and it really helps to kind of share what he has been kind of up against recently. Not only in education, but the decisions that they have to make as the AO continues to grow. John, you talked about how the AO has grown since we kind of got involved years ago, mm-hmm. as it's moved from mainly you know, a placement organization where you have surgeons, maybe some prosthodontists, and now it's 
really all encompassing. And yeah, yeah. whenever we say that, we're, what we're saying is, is that there's always now, from here forward, there's a big push at the AO to bring people together, just mm-hmm. like we've talked about in one of our previous episodes with Dr. Lemke, is that we the AO is all about bringing people together, mm-hmm. whether it's through a journal and you're having a conversation around a table or bringing people together um, in your backyard, right, at sitting around drinking coffee or having a drink and, and you're talking to your surgeon and you're trying to learn how to communicate to better, uh, better, and then Maybe even if we get back to going to meetings someday, and I right. think we will, we will. Yep. It's going to be maybe a little bit different. There's, but there's still this growth that Dr. Stanford is talking about, yep. and they're looking at ways to really bring our profession together. Yep. And we so always that, like the fact that that you know, if you go to a lot, if you get involved with certain implant organizations, they mm-hmm. are kind of more of a hey, this works in my hands, so right, I'm right. going to show you what I can do. And, and, you know, hopefully it works in your hands. Well, the AO is not that way. You know, they believe in science first. They believe in research first. Uh, Dr. Stanford, of course, has been involved with that his entire career. Um, and they believe in doing things that are evidence-based. And I know that that kind of gets worn out. Uh, maybe in your mind you think, oh, evidence-based, evidence-based. But mm-hmm. it's it's really the truth. And that's one of the things that I think as general dentists, especially if, that's, if you're listening to this, you know, we should not be afraid to dive into you know, being in that world right along with our specialist colleagues of making Mm -hmm. sure that what we're doing follows best practices, best evidence. And I think you're going to hear the passion from Dr. Stanford on how the organization is trying to integrate with the changing market, the fact that there's a competitive marketplace. Yes, we know there's a business side of this, but we have to keep our standards high and we have to keep it research, evidence, science-based. And really, We have to be doing things at the highest possible level. So I think that as you listen through this episode, you know, you're going to, I think, see why Dr. Stanford has a very forward thinking approach to, you know, the future of education and meetings and has some really interesting thoughts, too, because we do get them to be clinical on uh, on things about uh, implant prosthetic design, connection type. He's had a ton of uh, we ask him some really interesting questions and. I think it's up for debate still, you know, about right. what's some of the what answers matters. that he gave, what matters really. Yeah. And, and it's a great debate and we can't wait for you to hear that because stay tuned for that. That's at the end of the show, right? Yeah. And we asked that at the end of the show, but he's got some, some great things to, to, to say to you guys that are members and to non-members. I hope you're tuning into this. If you're listening to the dental guys side, if you're not a member of the AO, you should check them out. And if you're listening to this from the AO side and you're not a member, you should check it out and become a member because yeah. there's great benefits uh, to be, being a member. So we're excited to have Dr. Clark Stanford join us, and that'll be right next. Hi, I'm Justin Goodbray with Financially Simple. So perhaps you're considering buying your first practice or your second, third, or fourth. Here's a tip for you. You know, there are many great reasons to own your own practice. You can make your own schedule, guarantee the quality of work, and potentially increase your income. But are you aware? that 80% of businesses fail in the first five years, and only 4% of businesses exist after 10 years. So I ask you, what are you gonna do to avoid failure? My advice is to work with a competent advisor who has a proven track record. Rely on an expert's experience versus peer insight. For more information about this and other dental related topics, visit financiallysimple.com forward slash dentist. This tip is for informational purposes only. Please speak with a competent financial advisor regarding your specific needs. Justin Goodbread is a registered investment advisor with Heritage Investors. Visit heritageinvestor.com, financiallysimple.com for additional information. Well, hello and welcome to this episode of The Dental Guys in collaboration with the Academy of Osteointegration. We're bringing this special episode to you featuring the president of the Academy of Osteointegration, Dr. Clark Stanford. So, Dr. Stanford, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you, Wes and John. It's a great pleasure to have you and thank you for taking the time to speak with me tonight. Yeah, we're excited to have you on, and and for those of you who don't know, uh, Dr. Stanford, I'm gonna I'm gonna give the official you know introduction, and then we'll give a little background as to how we kind of maybe first learned about uh, him as well. 
So Dr. Stanford has been involved in education for a very long time and most recently uh, became uh, the dean in 2014 at uh, University of Illinois at Chicago and distinguished professor there as well, which is kind of a big deal, the distinguished professor thing. We will, you know, we know that uh, if you do a little research on you. Um, and we, so we know that uh, he, he's, he's had this, this educational background and also has been involved with continuing education um, and uh, in, in several different organizations, of course, with the Academy for, for quite some time. So the personal side of this, which is interesting. Uh, oh, this is good, John. Yeah, is that, you know, if, if you guys have been listening to podcasts for a while, you know that kind of this started <clears throat> back years ago when Wes and I started having this ongoing Google Hangouts conversation about cases and research and implants especially. And that all began when we met at uh, a, the AstroTech World Congress in Sweden in 2012. Wes and I met in Sweden, which is so weird. And you were there along with uh, a good number of other people. And at that time, you were doing some presentations. And so, you know, Wes, I think you used the word earlier before the show, uh, fanboys. I think we're, we, yeah. we kind of are. John and I, we've, we have been fanboys <laughs> of Dr. Stanford for a very long time. It's a pleasure so much to have him on the show tonight and yep. to talk about some high-level things. And let me tell you how much we respect Dr. Stanford. Recently, there was a article. Now, we are Geek's Corner, right? And yep. we go right to the AO for the most recent updates to a lot of information and we had a mentors meeting the other day surrounding an article that Dr. Stanford headed up and collaborated with other individuals about antibiotics in implant dentistry. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't read that article, let yep. me just tell you, It'll we challenge have you. changed. We have changed some things in our protocols because of some of the things presented in that article. So starting off with a little geek's corner, That's this right. is how much we respect the Academy <laughs> <That's right. laughs> and how much we are fanboys. Yeah, of Dr. Stanford. So we Welcome have to, to we show. have to say that, yeah, because it's this is a big deal. And one of the things that we really wanted to talk with you about uh, as we begin here, really getting into some meat of the topic here, is about dental implant education, because we know mm. that obviously the academy is very much invested and has been for a long time. Really, that's how it began. Was all surrounding how can we best uh, place and restore dental implants. Mm -hmm. And so we're interested okay. because you've had so much experience in, in the at, from the educational side and the postgraduate level and the you know dental school dental student level, uh, all the way into the you know kind of the the cutting edge of what you see at an AO presentation that's brand new. So we just want to get a feel from you. What what's the current status of dental implant education? How are we doing? And maybe beginning with kind of the postgrad level. And, you know, what's what's being done well and, and where are we headed? And uh, that's a broad topic, but we just like to kind of hear your thoughts on that. <laughs> Thank you, John West. It's, a, it's actually, to a degree, a difficult question to answer, very short, in you know, a brief amount of time. But the best thing to think of is um, when implantology really became mainstream in North America was because of the advent of bringing together a set of specialists working together in a true interdisciplinary manner. And that's why we were able to do a lot of the initial basic clinical research that actually showed and documented that, in fact, implant therapy was a predictable uh, treatment for tooth replacement uh, approaches. To that end, where the academy was created was to be able to bring <clears throat> as a common playground, if you want, of all the specialists that would normally kind of hide in their little academies and just talk in their little academies, never want to kind of share what they knew with other specialists who could actually complement their expertise. And so the academy came about in many ways to be that playground where all the specialists could come together and kind of let their guard down just a little bit and that also allowed the threshold to come up in terms of what was expected because everyone was expected to be performing at the top of their abilities. So when you talk about postgraduate education, we're seeing the same thing happening where originally, yes, oral maxillofacial surgeons were the ones primarily placing. Periodontists were kind of let in a little bit later, a little bit of controversy. Now what you're seeing is, as has happened many times with technologies in um, dentistry, as the technology becomes more comfortable and more widespread and the risks as well as the limitations are better understood, you're actually seeing that in many ways the therapy is expanded to a wider variety of providers 
throughout mm. the profession. And that's what we're seeing now uh, with uh, implant therapy with many other specialists. And of course, there are more general dentists placing implants now than all the specialists combined. Um, so the key thing though is understanding patient evaluation, <clears throat> understanding the actual, it's, it's easier to talk a patient into an implant than sometimes it is to actually place and predictably restore the implant. And I say that because a lot of providers, until they have gained a lot of experience in a variety of different ways, and I know we're gonna to touch on that, how one gains the knowledge and the experience and the training, if you will, is critically important so that the provider actually understands uh, the risk that they may be walking into with that particular patient. And that particular, both the patient themselves, the medical issues that the patient presents, and of course, the dental issues that need to be assessed. Mm. Postgraduate programs have been doing this well for a while. Um, yes, uh, prosthodontics uh, under the CODA accreditation now is surgically placing implants. Um, the issue is each of the specialists though still recognize that when they get out into practice, the best way to maintain a vibrant specialty practice is to understand your limitations and to be able to work as a team, especially on those difficult cases where you know, you, you will have a specialist colleague that will help and bail you out when you get into trouble, but mm -hmm. they're not gonna do it very often. And so that's this issue of really understanding the boundaries of what you're getting into. And I'm gonna tell you, there are some specialists that are excellent providers. There are some that are, mm, you know, they could, they could probably go back to school a little bit. There are some GPs that are absolutely excellent providers that are, are equivalent to anything I've seen with a specialist. So I think it's really the specialist generalist model. It's not as much um, the title. It is your experience and your training and especially your understanding of risk management um, and when to work as a team and when you can work um, as a solo provider. Now let me ask um, kind of a follow-up to that idea of the multidisciplinary side <clears throat> of what's going on at the Academy of Vasa Integration and also in post-grad world because you mentioned kind of the order of things sort of went from surgical specialties kind of began this journey. But now that we've come sort of full circle to really everything being restoratively driven and prosthodontically driven, how is the postgraduate side doing with actually having the surgical specialties truly understanding the restorative side of things? Because that seems to me like it's always been the disconnect and the struggle, uh, even to the point where you know, prosthodontists have, 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 of course, begun implant training and, and to, to be able to have at least one idea behind that being in more having more control over certain things. But how well do you think that the surgical side is is really understanding when they come out of specialty training, um, the relationship of where these implants need to be placed to achieve the best restorative outcome? That's an excellent question. And I think the best way to answer it is the advent of a variety of, of imaging technologies and the software tr um, programs that have come out over the last 15 years to be able to do simulation surgery so that the oral surgeon or the periodontist actually has a better understanding because many of these treatment planning approaches actually needs a diagnostic restorative component that's built in either placed in the patient's mouth or it's virtually designed based on the imaging of the face or the imaging of the ridges. But by doing that, the oral maxillofacial surgeon and the, uh, the periodontist is actually understanding better what are the restorative needs of the referrers. Because in the end, it a complication um, needs to be actually predicted um, ahead of time, and that's what the software does. Now, mm -hmm. periodontics does have, as a part of their specialty, they do have to do some restorative care uh, to actually understand, in some ways, the limitations of the other side of what mm -hmm. they've done. But that's simply to help to connect and complete the circle of what they saw in the virtual world in the diagnostic and treatment planning phases, which we all should be doing and working as a team. Mm. So the, basically technology has kind of become an answer uh, to that world. And <clears throat> I think we're seeing more of that every time we go to courses is, you know, it's much easier to mm. show somebody an anticipated result. Uh, and, and so you can see what a 
deviation of five degrees at the apex does to you uh, when you extrapolate that out in a in a digital wax up. And I could see that, and I and I'm, I'm glad to hear that that that's kind of where we're headed because I feel like that's to you 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 know you can't you can't learn prosthodontics and surgery uh, in your in your residency. You know you and so if you're learning surgery, there's got to be a a quick way, a quicker way to at least start to understand that. And, and let me ask maybe one more follow-up question. I know Wes has got a question too, but it, it, the different schools have, it seems like, different specialty programs that, if you will, are maybe driving that ship a little bit. You know, you have mm-hmm. some schools that seem to be driven more by the surgical side of things or more by the prosthodontic side of things. And does that make a difference, do you feel, um, uh, still where you go to school? Uh, it, how, which program you go to, whether you will get that balance or do you feel like it's becoming more standardized now to where you can go to a lot of different places and come out with kind of the same basic, uh, beginning knowledge when it comes to specialty training? Well, the, uh, s- smart ass answer here is say, uh, come to UIC cause we're the best. But, <laughs> you know, Just the, set but, you up for that. <laughs> yeah. But no, the reality is, is that as a st- because of the competency standards that we all have to match, there is a basic threshold of knowledge that we all are providing. Where the differential comes in is the access to technologies, and most schools are getting pretty good at that. Um, mm. Some schools are struggling with a range of patient care because they may be located in an area that doesn't have a patient volume mm. mm-hmm. of a range of cases that are as easy to come by. Um, but I'm going to argue a lot of it comes down to the quality of the faculty. And it's the quality of the faculty that are engaged, that are staying up to date, and I would hope most schools have that, and being able to kind of push the edge because what we do in terms of human endeavors is the ability to improve means we have to constantly feel maybe a little uncomfortable. And that's how we actually then know we're on the edge of Mm. constantly improving. Mm. And to feel uncomfortable by myself, all all I am is I'm uncomfortable. But Mm. if I'm with a team and I'm uncomfortable, I can look to my surgeon and say, okay, what do you think about the way I'm thinking on this? And Mm -hmm. use an example is um, jaw in a day, which we do quite frequently at the school where the first time I looked at someone's leg and said, well, okay, we're putting the implants there and I've already pre-designed my prosthesis and that's defining where the implants are going in the leg and then all of a sudden this big piece of bone moves up to the jaw and then all of a sudden when the patient, when I look and do my final impressions, it's like, darn, that's, that's pretty close. Mm-hmm. And it's like, I would have never thought I could do that. Um, and that's what a team does. Hmm. John, you just sent me a message and it was the exact question I was going to ask. We are so in tune with Love one it. another. Now here we had the opportunity to interview an educator, Mark Ludlow sure. on the podcast. And I know, you know, Mark, and he's doing some high level things, uh, down in South Carolina, actually medical university of South Carolina is where he's stationed at as an educator. And he's doing some things with uh, pre-doctoral uh, dental students. Let me ask you this question. How much do dental students know right now about dental implants and what are we doing to change maybe that? Um, so, I mean, dental education has been evolving over since I was a dental student in the 80s. So yeah, I know it's been a while. But uh, it's constantly what we I made the comment earlier that one of the things that's happened is dental educators, by and large, many of them are specialists. And Mm -hmm. what we have had to do is get um, to the point where we actually understand the range of outcomes that we can do. So then we have basically been able to now understand what a beginning, uh, what I call a novice provider, what do they need to know to understand their risks to be able to provide it. And so I can speak for the two institutions I've been most recently at. We teach a comprehensive didactic. We teach a comprehensive risk space. We teach, of course, a a comprehensive restorative. And then we have a selective for implant surgical experience for some students who um, have that particular interest uh, to have that exposure in dental school. I would argue, though, to finish dental school, I would argue I would be uh, reticent to say you're ready to practice routinely implant dentistry. It Mm -hmm. takes quite a bit more 
uh, to be able to be ready to feel where you understand <clears throat> where your boundaries are, where the guardrails are mm -hmm. of the kinds mm -hmm. of patients you should select to do as a solo provider and what you should do as a team. Yeah. And that leads to the, to the actually kind of a nice segue is as we move from even pre-doctoral students to graduating as a dentist um, and you're, you've, you know some risk, you know a little bit about implant therapy, as we move into the, you know, the real world per se of a practicing clinician day in, day out in a private practice, and then also as we move from even a prosthodontist might move from um, you know, education into practice and a periodontist moves from education into practice, I think it would be good for us to hear about the state of education, continuing mm -hmm. education in raising the level of implant knowledge and where do people start? You know, I think that would be a great question. We've asked this before on the show to other people, but where do you go? Like, it, let me ask you this. If you had your dream, if you were a dental student and you weren't going to postgraduate, where do you go? Where do you start? What do you learn first? Mm. Um, so... Where do you, as an institution, or where do you learn in terms of the approaches that you're... Well, more continuing learning. education. If you were to say to yeah. a graduating dental student, or say they've just graduated from a, mm -hmm. they've just finished a GPR, uh, they're ready to begin private practice without post-grad training, would you say, uh, you know, what would you, how would you direct their continuing education journey? Get yeah. a good mentor. Get a mm -hmm. good mentor who you trust. It doesn't have to be in your town. It could be through Zoom Dontics, which is what we're doing right now. Yep, right. Um, it is in any forum where you have a trusted advisor, where you can let your guard down and you can have an honest conversation and they can be honest with you like, hey, Wes, this is right in your uh, barnyard, go for it. Or yep. you know, maybe you should hold off and do this other. Uh, historically, that's been in what we call study clubs and the study club model has worked a lot uh, because it has this. Uh, for younger providers, I actually normally strongly, and I've been, uh, had the opportunity to work with and lecture and, and do hands-on with a number of practices that have these um, continuums. And I find for especially people who are kind of building their repertoire of understanding, a continuum where it may be uh, a group of colleagues get together and they have four days together they then break and then two months later they have another uh, weekend and they do another set of exercises. Then all the time they're treatment planning and then they come and they bring their patient cases. They all talk mm -hmm. about them as a group. <clears throat> then there may be some surgical care that may be mentored if they mm -hmm. uh, would like that by a periodontist or a surgeon or whoever. And then it's over typically a year long period but it's building confidence mm. when you may not, you know, a novice provider leaving dental school, they may have taken out at my school probably 100 teeth. They may have done a few perio procedures, but they don't really feel that comfortable and they mm. really want that um, uh, set of training wheels to really get the confidence so that they can actually continue to build their repertoire. I where it. I get nervous, and I'll lay my cards on the table, where I get nervous is if they go just for the weekend course, mm -hmm. they buy the kit, yep. and yeah, everything looks great on a sawbone model, but the first time they look at a patient and they realize laying a flap is kind of hard work, <laughs> um, they suddenly, the kit goes in the closet, and the implant company goes, where did that customer go? Yep. So yep. that is where having a, a group of advisors, a group of colleagues that you trust and you can let your hair down, so to speak, um, that I think works well. John, yeah. here we are again same talking thing. about mentorships, the yep. same thing that we urge anyone listening to this, that if you're interested in taking it to the next level, as we like to say all mm. the time, Branamark said, surround yourselves with people that are better than you and you're bound to succeed. Great minds around you all the time, being humble enough to receive criticism mm -hmm. and 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 having someone that you can let your guard down with. This is the key to success. Yeah. And it's and it's, it's not and it's, the and it's interesting <clears throat> because we're gonna be 
I think, depending on how everything rolls with the AO meeting next year, talking a little bit about this uh, there so potentially. Good, uh, uh, we we were asked, we, we, it was kind of like, whoa, amazing, but to, to present on some of this stuff because mm-hmm. social media has become a inter- an interesting world when you because mentorship used to mean something that was very personal and it was very interactional it was mm-hmm. it was in person discussion it was you know even maybe it was sending cases through email or it was you know photos and things like that and and social media has kind of taken on this this you know little bit of a double edged sword with what mentorship means and you know you've got kind of the before and after beautiful shots uh you know with 27 steps in between that are not shown and people uh think that this is easy and then on the other hand you have some really good positive uses of social media to help to push you know what's what's possible and and to show the 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 failures and the mistakes and the things that, that people can learn from and so we think that uh, that that world we we ur- we continue to urge, especially our younger clinicians, to not focus so much on that only, but to really seek out the real world. And we feel mm-hmm. that's one of the values of say going to like the AO annual meeting, is it's you know you can't really fake it as much. You know you you have to sit there and t- and interact with somebody, and they'll ask you a question, and if you don't know the answer, you really you know you can't just run away, you know, and I think that 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 sitting and receiving that knowledge, you know, speak to that because you've been in this world of education since the 80s when the only format, the only way to get on the podium most of the time was you had to have published some things and you had to have mm-hmm. done some things and you had to have proven yourself and it was peer review was the whole name of the game. And that's changed in the social media world, right? In some ways. So do you still see the value of the in-person education, the meeting, the lecture format, you know, talk about that versus what you're seeing with some of the virtual education that's going on. How effective can that be? I know you're probably in the world of virtual so much now, even with COVID, you know, how is this, how can this work? Can it work and can it, or is it, is it more of a problem in some ways? Hmm. Um, so I'm going to answer as a politician. I think it's, um, it's going to be a long time before people will be that comfortable being in a room of seven to 10,000 people uh, arm to arm. Uh, mm. And I think that's just the social reality right now. It will come back to a degree. Um, but it does question, do you go to a large meeting for the education and networking component? Or do you go to the large meeting to literally learn something that you already know. Um, This is kind of the running uh, issue with continuing education is when you talk to most healthcare providers, physicians, nurses, PT, dentists, when they go for a continuing education, they almost always go to forums or meetings or sessions that they already know a lot about. Mm -hmm. They don't go to the session they don't know anything about. And so this is kind of the challenge when we start thinking what I call hybrid models, where you have a hybrid model where you could do an online to push yourself into an area that you're uncomfortable, but you would never kind of admit that you were at that kind of national, or you would would never want to spend the resources to go to a national meeting. But now you (laughs) suddenly find, well, gosh, you know, maybe I need to understand what they're doing in dermatology to be able to adapt to what I'm doing in my soft tissue grafting Mm. and Mm. how I then can delay and create a different incision because the world of, um, I'm I'm thinking in my mind, the the world of ophthalmology and ophthalmology surgery has treated and trained and changed a lot about how incisions are made. Mm. Um, And so, but you wouldn't as a dentist ever go to that meeting, but you could do it in a hybrid forum online and then you take it to a larger forum meeting uh, where it evolves into what we might be doing then in the profession of dentistry. Mm, man, that's a challenging so it's a, a forum, interesting a forum. Is, Okay. So it's a, it's a blending. So I believe the future is going to be a blending of, um, we haven't talked about this as a board, but I <laughs> believe the future is there's going to be smaller regional meetings that people will feel more comfortable traveling to, hmm. but you're only talking 100 to 300. 
Mm -hmm. And we may have more uh, hybrid learning uh, that is uh, just in time when you need it in your own practice. And then we may have fewer larger forums uh, that people get together, uh, partly because people, I think, will become more comfortable learning in this uh, forum. Hmm. Um, if anything, we're forcing grade school and high school kids to learn this way right now. So. <laughs> That's right, <laughs> whether they like it or not. Yeah. It takes a lot to make something big very personal. Mm. And that's what we've lost in some of these bigger meetings. Yeah. And it really is the after dinner or dinner conversation where the mentorship mm -hmm. and the learning happens. John, how many times, oh, yeah. and I know Dr. Stanford's right yeah. here with us, have we sat down and just drew on the napkins yeah. and we've studied and we've talked about the things that we've heard or things that we already know and understand? And John... This is where this is this is this is a state of the art in education, yep. you know, and and I want to kind of segue because we'll be respectful of the time of the listener and Dr. Stanford. I want to move to this is the current educational model in how to, we learn to play surgically you know implants and to restore them, right? If I didn't receive any education, in my GPR or in my doctoral training or even in, you know, even in my postgraduate training, if I'm an oral surgeon and I want to know more, or if I'm, you know, a prosthodontist and I want to start placing, rather than going back to school, the, there's several current models right now uh, where we might go and just do a bunch of <clears throat> implants, maybe in a foreign country, right? Maybe we, even locally, we might do some placement and we might have some didactic and we might have the mix of sawdust model. We might have pig jaw. There's all kinds of mix. Tell us about the state of the art and how that relates to where we're at currently, your dream of where it is going and maybe where we're at currently. And what is the AO really doing? right, to influence this, because we believe the AO, John and I do, has had great influence on implant dentistry, okay? Now, we're biased, right? We're not paid to say this, but we believe that the journal, the Academy Journal, is, one, is the greatest implant journal in the world. And so what is the Academy doing to next level this your dream of education, like if I want to go and learn, there's a lot to unpack with what I just talked about. So let's unpack that in the last part of the show. So there's a, uh, the best way to unpack this is to recognize that uh, we need uh, areas where people, you know, the, the human, if step back in time, humans are tribal. Humans learn by stories. That's the most powerful way that you remember because you put yourself into the context of the story. Oh my gosh, I've seen that patient. Or oh my gosh, I have seen that mess up. Or oh my gosh, I've seen the perfect case that shouldn't have happened. And every one of us feels that near miss. And that's a story we all can remember. It takes though the recognition that the specialists and the GPs have to be able to be in a common forum where they do have that trust of each other. And rather than the power of the podium, they have to understand that the person who is presenting does have data, does have information, and does have knowledge, each of those have a different definition, that actually builds to being able to have evidence for what they are presenting uh, to that audience, given the risks and given the limitations uh, of the learning curve that each of those people have had. People rarely talk about the learning curve at the podium. And mm -hmm. so that's one of the things. Um, we are starting a new initiative, which um, I might as well throw out here. Um, it's called Doc Matters, which is actually a um, closed environment where AO members will be able to share cases, share uh, images, share a lot of information with each other in small group forums. It's a monitored forum, so it's not like a, a chat room on the outer internet. It's actually an enclosed environment. But again, <clears throat> it's this idea of I can reach out to a colleague in Germany, for instance, 
present it because I know he has had a lot of experience with this issue or this complication or this type of patient issue and they, we can have that intimate conversation in a closed environment where we know that we, something that we say, we wouldn't really want it out on social media because it would be misunderstood. This is one of the things that we're doing now is to create those safe spaces, if you will, for our members to be able to share, uh, because that's how we learn mm -hmm. uh, as, as co-mentoring. And the mentor-mentee role always has to switch back and forth. And mm -hmm. so that's one of the important things of what we're trying to do uh, with this initiative. And we see, too, that, um, you know, that we know that the AO has developed um, fellowship recognition and certificate program. Mm -hmm. um, because the other, the other side, to, and I think maybe part of where Wes was kind of going a little on this too, mm -hmm. was, you know, with all of these different models of continuing education leading to, say, surgical placement of implants, there's mm -hmm. discussion about which ones are, if you will, legit. You know, what is the, how do you, how do you legitimize the training that you have completed to show that you are you know, ready to, to place yeah, or restore I mean, implants. You can go to a weekend warrior course and start placing dental implants, right? right. Because I'm a dentist. Right. And as long you as I recognize, it. you can I'm, do it. I'm, I'm holding myself. If I recognize I'm holding myself and analyzing risk factors, like you've brought up so well, mm -hmm. that if you get that comfort level in one weekend, right. Or just whenever, I mean, you just feel like you want to start placing implants. <laughs> right. You right? can You've do read that. enough books. You can do that. <laughs> but I, I really want to, you know, I want some influence from an organization, mm -hmm. right? What is the AO doing, right? Yeah. Or what are they yeah. thinking about doing? So uh, I'll, I'll start with my favorite quote, which I've often used in my discussions, and that is Niels Bohr, a uh, Dutch physicist, said, an expert is someone who's made all the mistakes in a very narrow field. Mm. And it's an important thing to remember. And so one of the things that the AO is doing is we are creating a staged set of recognitions of the training, but also the experience that someone has. Because training is basically like training wheels. It gives you a lot of the basics, but then as you build experience over your career, you gain more and more, and that pushes you to continuously improve. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we're doing now is creating a staged approach to have the academy recognize not just the training, but the expertise that mm -hmm. the individual academy member um, has. Um, this is going to start with a reformatting of the certificate program. It's then going to move to a mastership level, um, a master's, if you will. And then it will move to a diplomate status. Um, and the master's and the diplomate status is going to be a combination of both documentation of your experience as well as evidence through um, a, a format of an examination to be able to verify that you truly have accomplished and you truly understand uh, the body of the training and the expertise that you now um, have. That's um, good. Hmm. So this is a process that we are starting right now. It's, uh, we've worked through, it's been approved by the board, and it's being rolled out um, this year. And it's a part of our new strategic plan for the academy that um, in my year as the president of the academy, we are actually implementing uh, the strategic plan that was started by Dr. Jay Monquist uh, in his uh, year last year. Now, how does that is important? Yeah. Uh, how does enjoy. that affect? So, I, I think that's I think it's awesome because I think that gives that with an organization like AO, where people know what it's about in general when they get involved with it, that it's based upon research and peer review and and science. And I think that that contrasts with with uh, some other groups that are more that are not as as focused on that. They're more just based on sh let me show you what I can do, and uh, and we feel that that works great a couple times, but not in everybody's hands. And it's important to have that, that research basis and that scientific basis. But when you, so if you look at that, then you start to, I guess, filter maybe the type of training you would choose. If say you are a general dentist who is wanting to get into implant placement, if you have a program like that and the AO says, here's our criteria for what we see as being, you know, a vetted 
clinician that is is a master in this mm-hmm. specific area, it kind of gives you a bit of a lens that you can look through at a training program and you could mm-hmm. say, this fulfills the criteria or at least part of the criteria <clears throat> that moves me closer to the this status. And, and is, is this going to be aimed primarily at, say, general practitioners who are wanting to, or is this going to be really just for anyone who wants to achieve this status? You know, what's kind of the, the thrust or the focus of that program as far as the type of clinician that you, that you're wanting to see involved? Well, I, you know, I think, John, it's going to be really for any member who wants to do it. Um, yes, it probably would initially appeal uh, to more of a uh, generalist um, who may not feel as much, but I don't think that's how it's going to evolve. I think it's going to evolve, and you're going to see a range of different people uh, that are interested in the mastership and the diplomate status because what it's showing is that you're actually performing and you have documentation of your expertise at the top of the profession recognized by all the specialties that are members of the academy. So mm-hmm. that's where the special, I think, recognition comes from this. Cool. Um, and, you and know, I, I think it's important to note that the, the committee that mm-hmm. is putting this together and approving these things is a mix, mm-hmm. right? And <clears throat> there's Perio, there's PROS, there's OMFS, and there's, there's three GPs mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. on this. Yep. And... I think it's fantastic. That's one of the things about the academy that John and I have just really noticed over the past, like, say, 10 years is that they want to be inclusive because, Mm -hmm. you know, of all the the specialties and the GPs, because they know that you said there was in the pre-show, you said that the general dentist subs out, right? Like we're subbing out a lot of work to our specialist. And I think it's important to kind of, and I want you to talk a little bit about that analogy, but, and why the AO, you know, is so interested in, you know, everyone, right? Because. Yeah. Cause I think, I ex- think the distinctive that I see with AO compared to some organizations is that rather than say, we're going to drop the bar to yeah. allow everybody in, it seems that you guys have come from the approach of, we want everybody's level to be to be higher and and we're going to try to basically set the bar but encourage those who maybe haven't quite gotten there um Mm -hmm. to to there's a path to get there and and is that is that sort of the approach that you're taking and and talk a little bit about that with especially the the general practitioner in mind yes so uh so i use the analogy um that much like building a skyscraper uh, it takes a general contractor with many, many subs. Um, if you want a skyscraper that's going to stand for a long time, it takes actually understanding all of the issues that are in play, and that actually takes a, a team to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where the role of the value, because maybe the best, the, pardon the analogy, the best plumber can do the best plumbing, the best electrician can do their role, the best structural engineer can do their role, but working together, they create a masterpiece. Mm-hmm. And creating a masterpiece takes uh, literally all of these people working together. And I think that shows then the value of where AO has always been around. And we come back to our earlier comment, what works so well with this is the fact that if you have a uh, communicate, it comes down to communication and where you could have a GP refer, for instance, a patient to an oral surgeon, and the oral surgeon says, you know, John, everything, this looks great, uh, but recognize there is a medical issue here that we uncovered in further um, mm. evaluation. Or a periodontist says, listen, there's a soft tissue issue that we've uncovered under further evaluation. Uh, the patient, in the end, is treated better. Mm-hmm. And in the end, that's what we're all about here is that um, you know, to, to, to have the best uh, patient outcome. And um, I wrote an editorial recently, which I call tie, like a bow tie, T-I-E, and that is the best way a team works together is through trust. Mm-hmm. Um, and then through trust, you build integrity of the team because you know each other, you hold each other accountable, 
And that's the only way you reach excellence, which is how Love to it. tie this together. And that was Love this it. idea of, uh, but it, it, the basis is trust. Um, yeah. And that's where this team concept comes from. Well, that's the first, you know, in the, the five dysfunctions of a team, right? That's the first failure is a lack that's of right. trust. You know, that's the primary failure in most teams. And I think that building that together uh, by having these kind of common, you know, uh, goals or, or common learning pathways, uh, common expectations, uh, that that allows everybody to have something to shoot for. And I love that. I, I think that I'm I, I'm excited, Wes, to hear what the organization's doing to push that forward because I think we you know we as as general practitioners who have really tried to try, as best we can you know learn from the best and have a team approach um, mm-hmm. feel that that's you know what we need because we see so many GPs that are sort of floating around, not necessarily they're kind of bouncing around from different place to place, not having that clarity. And I think part of it is we're not asking enough of people. Sometimes I think people th- will say, oh, you're asking too much. I think it's that we're not asking enough. And I think when you give mm-hmm. people a clear push to say, hey, this is this is the, the standard that we want to be at, m- a lot of people will rise to that. And, and even if they... Even if that just creates positive peer pressure to to see you know what's possible, hopefully that pushes the standard up because the alternative is the commoditization of dentistry um, and and have it just be where an implants and implants and implant and we all know that's not true and and it's also not easily reversible. So I want to change just as we kind of get closer to the end here. I want to respect your time, but I'm very interested to change because we've been talking about education and touchy feely things, which I love. But I also want to talk just for a moment about a little bit of implant science because you've done a little bit of work over the years in that area. And uh, so the question, the best question Wes and I could come up with, I mean, there were so many things we wanted to ask you, is the following. And you've already had this. So you've had a time to maybe think about it. The way we phrased it was rank which you view as most important for long-term dental implant success and explain your thoughts. Connection or interface design of the implant, surgical placement technique, or the type of prosthetic used. So we're interested to hear your thoughts on that. You know, how how each of these things affect long-term implant success. What, what are your thoughts? Uh, well, I'll speak to each of them quickly. Uh, the, the connection, you know, we've evolved from the external hex to some form of a conical connection, regardless of the platform. And I think right now, because of that, we've managed to actually reduce micromotion of the abutment joint connection. It's pretty stable now. Um, and I don't think that that's gonna, you're gonna see some dramatic tra- changes there. You may see some design architectural changes, trying to achieve different things. Implant surgical placement, that's, how do I say this nicely? It's a one time in history event but how history evolves around that implant is what's most important. So you can place an implant into what you think is good primary stability and good bone stock, and a year later all that bone is gone, and the surgical placement at that point is irrelevant. Um, And in fact, maybe it should be argued shouldn't have been done. Um, Hmm. So I come down to, and you know, of course, as a pros person, I'm gonna say this, if you don't create prosthetic contours that a patient can keep clean, hmm. it's going to fail. Hmm. And I've seen many prosthesis in the practice here in Chicago where I am, am practicing at the university. And these beautiful prosthesis come in and yes, they're a monolithic zirconia and it's, it's gorgeous porcelain and there's periimplantitis everywhere because Somewhere Mm. along the line, everyone was focused on the pretty porcelain, but they forgot there was a human being that actually had to be engaged in the care of that prosthesis. And it's not unlike selling someone a very fancy car and not teaching them how to drive. Mm. And I'm sorry, you know, there is no such thing as car accidents. There's only driver accidents. And it's not being able to take care of um, the work that's been done. So wait a second. Are you saying that. not everybody can just get a monolithic zirconia prosthesis, Dr. Sam? Are you saying that 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 lip support matters and flanges are a problem? I mean, come on. That's not popular. What I'm saying <laughs> is that there are different prosthetic approaches based on the... Di- just remember the 
nice big flange you put on a patient who's 50 years old who has reasonable dexterity and can prove to you that they're keeping it reasonably clean three years later when they stroke out mm. and they cannot clean and a care provider cannot clean, that patient's completely different. Mm. Um, so just that's why I, I say always keep in mind the prosthesis when you make it is made for a patient of that ability of your best estimate. Mm. But most people expect that prosthesis to last for a period of time and the patient's going to change and evolve underneath it. And we have so to be you, prepared to adapt to that. Are you also saying we don't know how to treat peri-implantitis? I would say it's better to prevent it than to ever try to treat it. <laughs> yes. That's a good, good answer. answer. That's a good so answer. if we're going to rank those, uh, John, from what I'm hearing, is that the most important thing to long-term implant success is the restorative design. Number two would be uh, we've kind of, you know, but let's just say that the connection is important. Mm -hmm. We know that we've found that better connections exist. And then number three, surgical placement technique, according to Dr. I'm Carl. talking about long-term outcomes. Yeah, long-term. Long-term, long -term, not short-term. You're short -term. basically this saying that, that if, if everything is controlled from the surgical standpoint and we have a good connection, those things we should know how to do well. Uh, and right. then the challenge becomes our aging population, it sounds like, and medically compromised patients. And it is interesting that we're thinking so differently now than we were 20 years ago because, they're, you know, the, the patients are living so much longer and, you know, with polypharmacy mm -hmm. and, and all the, the other issues that we're seeing. Um, yeah, I, I think that that's – it's kind of cool to see how, you know, the, the arguments over connection are sort of dying down a little <laughs> At least, because because I, yeah, I did I didn't hear. I mean, you really you really kept very calm yeah. through that discussion. Yeah. <laughs> no yelling or anything no. like that. So that's John. I know what camp I live in. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, we were just we just did a six part series on the zero bone loss concepts book, and you know, there's there's still some yeah. pretty you know st some pretty interesting discussion going on. But I agree. I think we're kind of coalescing now down to where you're seeing a little bit more standardization. Um, and, and now we can focus more on the, on the prosthetics. Um, wow. That's, Dr. that's a Stanford, great, great answer. We really appreciate you being on the show and I'm going to give you the last word before I close the show. But, uh, what I'd like to ask you to do is talk a little bit about the rest of the year and preparing for, I know we're probably going to have you, I'm hoping back on the show. Uh, I think uh, we had talked to the Academy about doing that. So I'm kind of putting you on the spot right now about that. Um, but before the annual meeting, tell us a little bit about some things that the AO is doing to maintain connection to its readers and listeners over the next com coming months. Thank you, Wes. So many of the things that we're doing is we've improved the membership benefits. We've added an additional journal. Um, we have this new platform that I just mentioned, the Stock Matters, that's rolling out this fall. We've increased significantly. We actually took practically the entire 2020 annual session and we moved it online through a whole series of repeat uh, webinars. Um, we're also going to have a webinar coming up here shortly about um, all of the highlights of the 2018 summit that I was the chair of. Uh, that was um, uh, addressed some very significant issues in terms of implant dentistry. Um, and we're having the, the primary three primary uh, presenters um, in that webinar. So we're doing that. We're also preparing, of course, for the 21 meeting that is planned for Orlando. And like everything, as Dr. Fauci says, the virus is dictating what we can do. Um, but we are planning right now for that meeting uh, that will be in Orlando. How it will look is going to be, I think, really going to be, look like a, a hybrid of uh, an intensive amount of online and face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. And I think, as I made my comment earlier, in many ways, I think that is a, a reasonably okay future for how we get together in terms of professional meetings. Mm. Awesome. Well, listen, if you're listening to this and you're not a member of the Academy, I want you to head over to osseo.org, osseo.org. And if you're interested in knowing more about the annual meeting and this professional development um, that we're talking about, you click on that professional development tab on the website. It's like right in the middle of your screen, literally. And there's a little segment there called annual meeting. You'll see some things about the annual meeting coming up in 2021. I know you'll want to keep tabs on that, but 
But even right now, if you go to the online learning center, this is where I head all the time. And there are two journals that are now available to members. And John and I were super excited about that Mm -hmm. because that just doubles down on what you pay as a member to be a part of the Academy, which I think is a still, even with one journal, because we had both journals coming anyway. Yep. And in Jomi, the Journal of Oral Maxillofacial Implants is the primary journal that has been there for years for the Academy. And then now, IP... IJPRD. Uh, IJ, IJPRD, International Journal of Periodontics and Restorative Dentistry. Now, it is a next-level journal as well. Mm-hmm. We've talked about restorative-driven uh, surgery tonight as one of the primary reasons for long-term success, and that journal right there is going to be one of your go-tos for this particular topic. So, yes... Um, full circle back, uh, I am and John, we are fanboys of the Academy and Dr. Clark. And listen, if you're listening to this, listen, the best thing you can do is follow the Academy on social media. They're on Instagram, they're on Twitter, they're on Facebook, and they're posting stuff all the time. I want you to look back, and I want you to look back for Dr. Lemke's interview with us that was recently released on how to maintain a great relationship with a specialist. Mm -hmm. That referring relationship is so important, and we talk about some ideas, tips, and tricks to kind of, you know, work on that. And then we also talked about, uh, talked with Dr. Malmquist um, back in when his son and their practice in Seattle and some of the things that they're doing in their practice. That was a great interview. And then, of course, this interview, and there'll be more to come. So much more is coming from the AO and the Dental Guys. Uh, you can follow the Dental Guys as well. Head over to the Dental Guys on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're on all that stuff. And we look forward to hearing from you. If you mm-hmm. please give us feedback in the comments section, someone will reach out to you, send us a message some direct message that we'll read and and just encourage us to continue doing what we're doing because we we love to hear the feedback and I know if you want to reach out to Dr. Stanford and you have a question leave that question in the comments section and we'll make sure that uh, the appropriate people get a hold of that and get that over to him so for Dr. Stanford for John I'm Wes and this has been another great broadcast of the Dental Guys and the Academy thank you so much for listening and good night thank you